EPMD made me want to form Compton's Most Wanted. Rakim made me want to rap. I think hip hop will always be a voice for the people. Hey everybody, I'm Reggie Williams, founder and CEO of Ambrosia for Heads. And with me, I have Jake Payne, our editor in chief. And tonight we got a very, very special guest. A legendary West Coast original gangster. What's cracking? Hey. Yo, 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 what's good? Great, man. It's an honor to have you, man. I've been a fan since day one. Since day one. You know, so like, like, you know, this is a real honor for me. I appreciate it, fam. You know what I'm saying? Uh just trying to keep doing what I do. So, you know, uh just to still be here trying to represent, you know, make some good music and you know, so uh that's what that's what it's about, man. So I appreciate the love. No doubt. Thirty years deep, right? And counting. All day. Plus, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you said hey, you said good music, man. And and you know, you and I have been talking for 17 years, you know, of those 30 just with albums. But this year, the latest album, you put out two of them this year, but the latest right. one is Lessons. That's why we're talking. So I want to begin there, you know, going off of the title and the theme. What's a recent lesson you've learned about life, about music, maybe something else? Um, I've learned how to be humble, more humble, more patient. Uh, uh, just just learn to be more accepting of, of, of mishaps in life and accept things as they come. So um, uh, the lessons I'm learning right now is, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older, but I'm still willing to willing to learn. Um, like I said, for me, it's just being humble and being patient. And I think that's the key to um, my life lessons, so to speak. You know, we're, we're dealing with this this industry and especially how it is now with the music industry and the downloading and the Black Lives Matter and all that. So just learning to be humble and, and patience is the virtue right now for me. Yeah, you talk about, you know, uh, acceptance. This is a year that's taught us all that we, 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 we don't have the kind of control we think we do, right? Like, so how have you dealt with, with that specifically? Of course, I mean, with the, I mean, with this year's this, this done served us a lot of blows, so to speak. Um, so um, just trying to, you know, fold into that, accept what's happened this year in 2020, uh, especially from an artist's point of view, you know, with not being able to tour and connect with fans and, and you know, concerts or whatever, it put us in a difficult place. But uh, that's why I say uh, my lesson has been learned is to be humble and patient and just watch what comes. Uh, it's a diff, like I said, it's very difficult for a lot of us as artists, you know, interviewers, radio hosts, whatever, not being able to connect. You know, I like that personal one on one to be able to connect with people. So it's just a loophole. But I think, you know, with us being patient and trying to overcome the obstacles, you know, we can get through what's going on right now and try to get back to some normalcy. Word. So, you know, on Lessons, you got songs with, with a lot of your peers. You know, we talked about like how rich your legacy is and you got a lot of cats on there who've been around for a minute too, Be Real, Corrupt, Havoc. Uh, you know, and on those songs, you don't just have them, you incorporate the hooks, like from How, how It Could Just Kill a Man and from Shook Ones. So were you fans of those records at the time they came out? Oh, definitely. Um, I always, uh, first when I, you know, get out with an artist, it's always about the music. And I'm a natural fan at first, you know, Be Real, Cypress Hill, uh, Havoc Mob, Deep, Corrupt, you know, so to speak. So um, I've always been a fan first, which enables me to uh, uh, connect with an artist that I try to get down with, you know, not to just be trying to use it for the, uh, the name drop or the, you know, that publicity era of trying to get the hottest new artist or whatever. I deal with dudes I respect it from the gate and dudes that I listen to, you know, I used to listen to all their records. I would go and buy their records from the record stores. So being a fan enables me to, you know, um, enjoy their music and 
makes me want to collaborate, you know, in a sort of sense. So that's what I think first, having that mutual respect for artists and being fans in general and appreciating the music that they have put out, you know what I'm saying? enables me to when i get down with them know their style know their flavor you know where they coming from so it makes the collaboration more easier you know is there a special you know i mean you've worked you've been one of the most prolific artists period but especially on the feature front i mean we talk about be real you were on that first soul assassins album you know you've always been part of so many extended families but when you're with a-list guys like, like the three reggie just mentioned is the chemistry different, you know, when you go to make a song, whether you're in the same studio or not? Uh, I, it all depends. Um, I think like just being, like I said, from the gate, um, being a fan and sometimes having that longevity friendship, you know, like because some of these cats I've known for a long time, you know, and not on aspect that I've done collaborations with them before, but some of them just the respect of just through the years of, of hip hop and the foundation of just crossing paths along the way. And so when I get in the studio with different cats, it's usually the vibe is usually the same, you know, because we we enjoy each other's company. You know, we maybe be kicking back, smoking, listening to the music, you know, vibing off that. And then, like I said, in general, friendship and fan from the first from the get-go so it's not like something that's collaborated as far as this manager hooked it up or the executive at the record company and then when y'all come together it's kind of a little you know tension not tension but friendly competition tension uh, so usually with dudes i go out to collaborate with i try to make sure that i have that connection as far as i know this dude in general so when we get in the studio if i get in the studio with a with a corrupt or i get in the studio with a premiere or i get in the studio with a with a be real everything is basically from left off from the last time if we collaborated on his project or whatever we just try to keep those lines open and then i try to regularly talk to these dudes you know mm. outside of calling for a favor so to speak I try to just hit them up and be like, hey, what's cracking today? What you on? You know, just checking in with you, fam. And when they put out of the projects, be a fan of that. Con congratulate them on the projects they release, even though it's not my project. I think you need to do that. That's that's what keep everything open and fresh as far as when I'm concerned, when I collaborate with those type of artists. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you prefer to really get in the studio when you do a collab on that, just like sending tracks by emails and everything. I prefer it. I prefer yeah. to uh, get in the studio with a cat. I mean, the connection is always better like that when you face to face, you know, you know, because of COVID, we've had to been sending tracks back and forth. But like I said, I've been in the studio with would be real. I've been in the studio with Premier, you know, with Corrupt, with Chio, with a lot of artists. So we 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 kind of like, like I said, established a friendship long ago. So it's like a you know family reunion when we get together. You know, mm -hmm. we we all try to have fun, uh, take the seriousness of recording the song, but you just try to you know like 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 relatives getting together. You know, that's what it is for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've um you're one of the most like photogenic artists in hip hop. And what I mean by that is there are amazing photographs of MC8. You know, there's early photos of CMW. You talk about, you know, premiere and like photos of you guys in New York City walking down the subway steps. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about two though. And one I know you've talked about before, but there's a photo we've shared it on AFH's Instagram. It's you, old dirty bastard, and E40. Mm -hmm. It's just like in all three of you, it's like a candid. It was just like somebody boom, popped up with the camera. Do you remember that moment? What was going on? Um, we were at, I believe, uh, one of E40 producer studios up in the Bay Area. And uh, I think we were up there to, uh, I don't know if it was a convention or whatever. And uh, Old Dirty, I had I had known Old Dirty from back in New York, from dealing with Wu-Tang, being in the videos and all that. Uh, I was in a Can It Be Also Simple video. So um, I got to know early Old Dirty Bastard, you know, and uh, E-40, I had done a few shows with, he was from the Bay Area. So um, when Old Dirty dropped his song, Shimmy Shimmy, 
he was out here on the West Coast. And I think we had all managed to be in the same place at the same time, so to speak. And um, E-40 suggested like, hey, let's run to the studio. And we ran to the studio. And then I think Studio Tone came up with the beat. And then um, we collaborated and it turned into the Shimmy Shimmy remix. Oh, that was when the remix was just us hanging out, so to speak. It was another engagement and we just decided, hey, let's roll to the studio. And it just ended up being the Shimmy Shimmy remix. So that photo was, was probably catching us off guard of probably coming out of the studio or headed to the studio or probably just collaborating and chopping it up in a circle. And somebody was like, hey, can I get a photo of you guys? And we all turned around in that quick Ooh. second. <laughs> and, and I mean, so, uh, oh, go so ahead. that was mid 90s, you know, uh, so, you know, the, the heart of the kind of East Coast, West Coast. Piece. So how did you like stay above the fray in that? Because obviously you maintain those relationships. Um, just trying to be, um, like I said, just try to be genuine and a friend outside of a hip hop artist, you know, not trying to get into too many um, misunderstandings with other artists, so to speak. I think when you walk that straight line and you sort of uh, keep yourself away from a lot of friction, it, it, uh, it, it allows other artists to look at you in a different aspect of like, you know, eight, eight, eight is straightforward. You know, we don't hear too much bullshit. You know, we didn't see too much mess. You know, I wasn't one of the cats who was out there, you know, trying to battle every artist or have beef with every other artist, uh, regardless of the coast you were. Um, just humble. That's what dudes have always told me, you know. Eight is one of the humblest cats that we know, you know, never fussy, never whatever. I just walk my line and stay in my lane. And I think from that, um, not trying to get into nobody else's arena, so to speak, stay in my lane, you know, and keep my eyes on what I do. And I think that has gathered me respect from other artists that they feel like, you know, eight is a cat that we really can function with because he never is in any kind of mishaps that would fuck our career off or jeopardize, so to speak, what we trying to do. So like I said at first, when you when you have been in this business a long time, you tend to establish relationships and friendships with cats that when they show respect for you and you show respect for them, it tends to continue like, like I said, like a well or machine. And that's what I'm, I'm, I do. I try not to beef with no other artists. It's silly, it's stupid. I know I have in the past, you know, had a, had a beef with DJ Quick, you know, that squashed and, and after that, it just wasn't meant, you know what I'm saying? You want to maintain and have longevity in this music business, then you have to associate with a lot of cats. And that's what I do. Just be humble and stay cool with cats. And I think I gather that respect from a lot of dudes. But, uh, you mentioned, you know, I, I want to jump ahead to something else I wanted to ask you since you mentioned quick. I, what I think is so amazing about that relationship and that, you know, that that peace offering, that olive branch is you guys pieced it up in like 98, you know, and we all remember being happy to see the photograph of the two of you smiling, but you waited some time to make music together. Um, you know, and it was a two or three years ago when Quick and Problem put out the Rosecrans. You were on two joints and they were incredible. You know, can you just speak about the value of waiting and, and building a relationship that maybe there wasn't there wasn't a place for as two talented artists to go make songs together versus doing it right away for the cloud or for the, the talking point? Well, and generally speaking, you know, our beef was established because of neighbor, neighborhood riffs, you know quick being a blood, me associating with the Crips. Um, it was just a natural thing. Probably if we would have never grabbed the mic, it's just, you know, something that happens until I think um, you can mature enough to uh, extend the olive branch, so to speak. So even though we had squashed the beef, it still was, you know, still was to not, not to say tension, but you know, it had went on for a long time, you know, and, and 
we wanted to basically probably see, you know, the encouragement between each other of if it was going to be smooth after the beef was over, you know, we see each other out in the streets. Okay. Handshake. That went good. Uh, we see each other at concerts or whatever, you know, handshake, pound, that went good, you know, and then and the more and more we started running into each other, it just turned into a mutual respect. Okay, you represent Compton, I represent Compton. It was never about the bullshit beast in the in the past or the gang shit or whatever. You know, you trying to uplift your side, I uplift my side, and that's what I think with us just running into each other, running into each other, and being more mature and growing up and having the respect for each other's music and craft, we were able to open up and be like, man, let's work. And then actually Problem uh, brought that together because, you know, I had dealt, I had talked to Problem a lot. You know, I ran in the quick a lot. You know, we used to run into each other, no beefs, no, you know, no exchanging of words. Everything was mutually cool. So I guess with Problem seeing that, you know, he orchestrated to me to come to the studio and start working with him and quick. And I just pulled up at the studio that night, didn't know that we was going to end up doing two songs, but it's just what happened, you know, and I'd, like I said, I guess that just comes from knowing each other throughout Compton over the years and years, and then just having that mutual respect for each other's music and just being grown ups. you get me? Just just being mature and able to grow up and grow past the neighborhood beefs and probably the outsiders with the, you know, the friction or whatever. When we are able to talk and just connect as two grown men, I mean, it was like shit. What the fuck was we beefing for? Yeah, you know, on that's perfect. You say comp until I die, what you think, but in a better place, no beef. You know, and you've said many times that. It comes with maturity, but what would what advice would you give some younger cats about how to avoid or to revo re revolve, resolve beefs that they're you know what, you know how how would you kind of guide them as an elder person who's been in it before? For myself as a youth, a lot of na a lot of beefs came from. I want to say just old shit. You get me things that were things that arose before your time of infiltrating that situation as far as gangs is concerned. So a lot of dudes uh, inherit the gang shit or the problems with trying to become that artist. So me, I would tell a dude just, it's difficult because you wanna remain true to your neighborhood or whatever, but then you getting into an arena where you want to gather fans and people as far as music is concerned. So um, try to avoid, you know what I'm saying, the pitfalls of the neighborhood, because I, I understand a lot of us were trapped in the hood, took us under, so to speak. But it's kind of difficult to avoid beasts. But if you can, try to maintain on the music and just make sure your music is good. You can't control what the other side is, but maybe if you take the straight path and try to just focus on, you know, um, the success of where you're trying to get as far as hip hop is concerned, then that might become better for you to avoid the street pitfalls. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You know, you shout out Blue Stamp Official, your label, a lot on the album. You know, what are the advantages of having your own label? Uh, just being able to be in control of your own destiny as far as music is concerned. Um, being able to experiment with music, uh, being able to uh, step out of the realm of what people are familiar with as far as what your music is concerned, um, taking your own pace, uh, putting out product whenever you wanna put it out at your pace. You know, if I wanna put out one album this year, I drop one album. If I wanna put out five, I put out five. Um, that's the beauty of, of owning your own label and controlling your own music and owning your own masters and all that. I mean, control is the key. Uh, you know, ownership is the key. So that's what it does for me. Uh, it controls my ownership. It controls my own music and what I see as music as that I want to put out as far as not having to deal with labels and trying to conform my style to what they think is working because you might got this cat doing it or this cat but you know 
ownership is me and, and running my own label is being able to control my own musical aspect as far as what I hear and what fans want to hear from MCA outside of what might be the popular sound right now. Mm-hmm. And what are the qualities in an artist that you seek? What you say? What are the qualities you seek in an artist that you assign? Um, hard work. Um, determination, um, being true to yourself, um, not following trends, um, not feeling like you have to follow the leader, so to speak, you know, make your own path as far as your music is is concerned and just have good music. I mean, we got a lot of artists who say they got good music, but we know what that is, you know, um, your, you know, your craft is everything, you get me? And if you want people to spend $10 and download or stream or whatever, I feel that you have to have quality music. So before you come out with music, just make sure that other people other than the homies you sitting up with every day appreciates it and likes your music, you know? That's what I would tell an artist that I, I'm trying to maybe sign or go after or whatever. Be original. Um, don't follow the trends and don't be braggadocious. If you don't got a Lambo, don't rap about a Lambo. If you don't got a million dollars, don't rap about how you papered up and, you know, you hold in a stack of money that you done borrowed from somebody and the chain, you know, be original. And that's what I like, you know, in artists originality and not having to go, okay, well, 10 other artists is rapping about popping pills and Lamborghinis and jets. So that's the way we should go. And I, I wouldn't fuck with no artists like that. I, I want the artists that go, well, why I gotta do what the other 10 artists doing? Why I can't do this? That That's who I, that's who I look for as far as artists who believe in their own. I mean, I think you deserve credit too because the quality's there, but you've, you were a pioneer of quantity. I mean, I know a lot of people attribute that to the Bay and people like, you know, Spice One, who you've worked with extensively, but it, Eight was always coming with a with an addition every year, you know, a new mm-hmm. album or, or sometimes more than that. And now, you know, in 2020, that's become, that's become the trend. We just see that with everyone because all they need is a click of a button, but you were doing it, um, you know, for all those years when it involved physical product. And I just feel like that needs to be, you know, stated that you're a pioneer in that regard. I wanted to, I wanted to drop records like every six, seven months when I was signed to Sony because it was so much stuff I had to write about and talk about. And I didn't get that, you know, let's wait two years and whatever, whatever. I hated that, you know, and that's one of the beauties of being able to uh, have my own label and my own situation is that first off, I always believe in the quality in music. So you're never going to hear me put out no bullshit just to throw something out there. You're not going to get that from eight. But I also believe in the quantity of music. You know, the way the motherfucking shit is today, you put out a record today and by next week, people want, what else you got? Oh man, I listened to that record from top to bottom. I banged it 20 times. And then next week they like, when are you dropping something else? It's just a hunger, I think, for the fans because they so enjoy what you drop in that they go, okay, I done listened to that a hundred times already, even though it's been a week. Yep. I want to hear something new. So to me, that's the hunger that makes me want to keep dropping album, 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 because the fans, you know, they request it and they want to hear quality music. And when you got so much shit that's going on today, as far as music concerned, you know, you get fooled and bamboozled a lot of time with music. You know, you could see an artist and might think, oh, man, this might be whatever, whatever. And next thing you know, you know, you got the you got the, the first round draft pick that's going to be a bus. You know, so, Ryan Leaf, yeah, and there you go. So, I, I just believe in in when you have that that lane to keep putting out quality music, then that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, whether it's one album, two albums, you know, if I can drop two albums and drop a CMW album and do stuff like that, because we were myself 
felt like, you know, we were underground heroes, you know, so a lot of people didn't get to focus, even though, you know, I had the movie and all that. And I feel that we still have a, a long climb to go. We still got a lot of material in the vault that, you know, when people were focused on other big name artists, you know, we kind of got swept to the back burner. And now that we are in this state right now of COVID and 2020 and everything is slowed down and people are really focused on the music because everybody's at home and their laptops are streaming and downloading, people have a chance to really listen to some good quality music. So we get to slide up in there and then just bingo, oh man, you know, it reminds them of the yesterday of good music that Compton's Most Wanted used to get out with. So it's introducing us to a new audience, which is good. You know, you talk about Compton's Most Wanted, and when you go back and listen to those albums, they were extremely musical. You know, uh, you know, rich with like Isaac Hayes and like old like stack samples. And you all didn't get into the Parliament Funkadelic thing. You know, how no. did you carve out your own sound sonically? It was still very West Coast, though. Um, half of that was DJ Slip. Um, DJ Slip wasn't your normal producer. Um, he never wanted to follow, like I say, the trend of what music was. Um, because let's face it, the West Coast sound was Dr. Dre at the time. Um, Dre, you know, Parliament, George Clinton, you know, uh, Fat Back, you know, a lot of funky groove 70s, you know, shit. Um, we were different. Um, Millie Jackson, Bobby Blue Bland, Tyrone Davis. Uh, we came from that era of the meters, like you said, Stax Records. Um, we wanted to be different. Not to say that we wanted to outdo NWA, but we wanted to tell our story from a different side of the street, so to speak. So thus our music was more, I call it, I call our music soundtrack to the streets because we filled you with horns and strings and dramatic outcomes and, and different drum riffs and all that. We never went for the Parliament George Clinton sound because the graphics we were telling as far as Compton's Most Wanted were, were, it wasn't a party. We were telling you tales from the hood because we were still in the hood at that time. So we saw the killings, the drive-bys, and even though dudes rapped about it and, you know, not to take away from nobody because let's, you know, NWA paved the way for us, Easy, Dre, you know, but we wanted to talk from the aspect of dudes in the hood gang banging every day. You get me? Not as far as the hustler or the or the big time dope dealer or, you know, whatever. We were young dudes standing on the corners every day with bandanas and rags and straps and getting shot at and all that. So we wanted to tell you that story. Uh, and I felt that it should be more graphic, the music, you know, it should be more uh, slow paced, heartfelt, you know, kick you in the gut type of, you know, uh, nigga struggling hood took me under drive by Miss Daisy type of music. So we always look for that extra sound, you know, shout out to DJ Slip because he was one of those cats who dug through the crates. You mm -hmm. get me? Mm -hmm. He didn't just Oh, yeah, they're sampling Parliament, George Clinton. No, Slip went to stores and he would flip through records and just find, you know, oh, man, what is this, the meters? And I'd be like, who the fuck is the meters? <laughs> and he, he was sample and shit. Next thing you know, we came up with the duck sick and all this type of shit. You know, Slip had a good ear for music. And then, like I said, my parents, you know, born, you know, in the South Florida, Mississippi, my auntie, you know, they were real heavy on uh, Millie Jackson type of records, Bobby Blue Bland, those, those, those blues records. So listening to that type of shit. And my auntie had a garage full of re records, like, from, from the floor to the ceiling in her garage. So as a young kid, I would just go through there and just pull out records and put it on. And then first thing I'd do is I'd run the slip. Here, listen to this. Here, listen to this. And then Slip would do his magic. So we wanted to just basically differentiate our sound from what was typical. Hmm. It's so dope to hear you mention Slip. And I do feel that he is an undersung hero of, 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 of hip hop production and sampling. Hmm. 
You know, I look at CMW and it's a lot like BDP to me because, you know, Chris and Skylar Rock started and unfortunately, you know, Scott, you know, passed. It was right. And Chris kept the group going through a number of years and then transitioned and rebranded himself as a solo artist. And I know you've dealt with so many challenges with CMW, you know, chill in and out, you know, of the prison system, production changing, label stuff. Do you ever feel that that transition from CM Dub to eight in the nineties, because you put out great music on both sides. Do you ever feel like that shapes or affects your legacy as, as an, as an artist? Um, it was never my plan to go MC eight. Mm-hmm. My plan was always to stay Compton's most wanted. Um, with the, you know, with the mishaps and, you know, what happened with Chill and going back and forth, you know, having to go sit down, whatever. Um, Sony felt that it was better for me to go MC8 because Chill was signed as Compton's most wanted. And like you said, he kept going back to prison. So that kept putting a strain on Epic because they were like, Count is most wanted, but nobody's here but you. You know, first project that happened. I think Chill missed out on maybe, I think Chill got out on maybe four songs on our very first album. And then uh, the next album, Straight Checking Him, he had to go sit down again. So I did the whole record by myself. As, and the same thing with Music to Drive By. So Sony felt the Compton's most wanted name was putting a strain mm-hmm. on being able to sell records to everybody. Sure. So to speak. Oh, Compton's most wanted. Oh, you know, and then, then after music to drive by, I started getting flack because we had all the Dolores Tuckers and all these people going after rap music, you know, and and uh uh Dukakis, whoever he was, uh said my record was something (laughs) about we come strapped and you know next thing you know i get a double sticker on the album and so it was a difficult time for Compton's most wanted so sony felt that to ease the minds of certain executives they would change Compton's most wanted to mc8 featuring Compton's most wanted and then they just dropped the Compton's most wanted all together when when that happened, you know, I mean, you guys signed as a as a group with two MCs. For you, just as a lyricist, as a rapper, did you adapt? To, I mean, obviously the proof is in the pudding. You know, we're on the we're you know we're on Zoom right now. But what was the challenge like for you when all of a sudden you realize like you got to write every sixteen for every song? Like for those few albums, like just talk to me about that pressure. Well, in the first two albums, I wrote all the songs. Okay, I've been used to writing all the songs. You know, I had wrote uh, Chills verses on a lot of our songs uh, until he came home and got stable and started doing production and he started writing it because, you know, that could stress you out. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we first came into the rap game, I had to write everything. You know, it's a Compton thing. I wrote, you know, um, straight checking them, uh, music to drive by. So I was used to writing uh both sets of lyrics so when it was time for me to transition into a solo artist it was just you know i cut four verses down to three basically is what i did when uh when that happened uh but uh it was a little strain because it was i we were used to cmw you know me chill slip you know we put mike t on after a while so it was just all us, you know, everywhere we went, us four, us four, you know, blah, blah. And then when Chill had to go sit down and then everything became about MC8, it was a little more straining because it seemed like the workload picked up a little more, you know, um, after the record started climbing, you know, the first one was good. Second one was better. Third one was awesome. Fourth one was the shit. So yeah. by that time, it was Minister Society and we come strapped. So everything was hectic with touring and acting and all that. And then the labels wanting you to get in the studio and start up the next project. So it was a little stressful and straining. But 
being used to writing all the lyrics before, it didn't put catch me off guard. It just basically uh, gave me the prowess to basically go, okay, this is what we got to do from now on. So you might as well just take the helm and just keep doing it because you've been doing it already. So it shouldn't stop no flow. But like I said, all the extra work started coming, you know, interviews and, and, and going on the road and touring and all that, you know, because at first I had, I wasn't used to that. My first two records, I didn't go anywhere. You know, I sat in Compton and I sat in a neighborhood. I did a couple of videos and then it was right back to Compton. So I hadn't got used to the real raps, rap artist life until music to drive by and then uh, Menace came. Hmm. You know, you talk about the stories you wanted to tell on records and from growing up in the hood, the straight up Menace to Mad City, you've made some of the best rap storytelling records ever. So do you think you get the credit you deserve as one of one of hip hop's uh, master storytellers? I never try to get into um, where I should be considered as far as, I mean, it is what it is, man. You get me? Um, when you're on a football team, basketball team, baseball team, you got the nigga making 300 million and then you got the dude making 5 million. You get me? Um, do the dude, it all depends on who you are, if you can handle that, you get me? Uh, I never thought that I should be other than where I am. So it didn't affect me. Um, I was a young poverty kid, you know, in Compton, growing up with a single mom and a sister, you know, lucky to be alive and make it to 21, you know. Niggas was getting killed off left and right in my neighborhood and all over Compton. So just to be able to pay a bill, pay a house note, you know, see my kids get out and and have a little money to enjoy life. I never looked at myself as, man, I should be here. I should be here. I should be. I just accepted it and just moved along with it. The jealous motherfucker or the person who is envious, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to deal with that of thinking like, man, they don't, I don't get enough respect. You know, I done broke some of the hardest shit ever. You know, I don't want to be that motherfucker. To me, that's an arrogant motherfucker. That's a that's a conceited motherfucker. Um, I'm on the team. You get me? Whether you want me to play quarterback or you want me to be the kicker, I'm on the team. I play my position and I stay in my lane. If you're the superstar, you go right ahead, take the podium. I'm finna pack up, get to the house, and I'm still coming home with a paycheck. You get me? That's how I look at it. So I don't um, quest to be. I let the people decide that. You get me? What I do as far as my music concerned. I mean, I, I, I make music, you know, and I accept criticism first. You know, I'm not one of the motherfuckers who go, man, I'm pissed off because, you know, uh, it, it's just not worth it, man. You know what I'm saying? There's a million things I could be doing besides where I'm at right now. And I like where I'm at. You feel me? Shit. So I'm <laughs> 30 good. years deep. You should, I like man. where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? I could be getting up at motherfucking four o'clock in the morning, hitting the freeway and rush hour traffic like all the other motherfuckers. You feel me? <laughs> yeah. But I get to work at my own pace. I get to do something I love. You know what I'm saying? I get to see my kids grow up. And I enjoy this shit. You know, I don't want for nothing else. So as it goes down, people know what I've done. True fans, as far as the songs I've written and the music I've put out. And that's good enough for me. I got a couple of plaques on my wall, so I'm, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you mentioned Menace, and I want to get into that in a minute. But, you know, um, in addition to your acting, you have some great soundtrack songs, too, you know, on both Boys in the Hood and Menace, two of the, you know, most important soundtracks in Black film. So how did, how did being, having such central roles in those soundtracks advance your career? Um, they helped my career extensively. I mean, if you ask me, I mean, Boys in the Hood, I mean, growing up in the hood, I had the number one song in the country at the time, as far as hip hop is concerned. I had the number one single. Um, uh, I got to meet John Singleton, you know, rest in peace. Um, 
this was the first time I got to hang out with Cube every day, you know, and I was a dude who admired Ice Cube, big fan, you know, so just to be able to be in a motherfucker like that presence and to be a young rapper, you know, and 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 telling that story as far as boys in the hood is concerned, um, it did great. Like I said, it helped my career as far as being a young rapper uh, out of Compton and trying to come up. It put me on a major scale across, you know, the biggest platform because it was put out by Warner Brothers. Uh, the movie was successful. Um, so it helped a lot because it put a young Compton's Most Wanted on a major platform for people to hear our story and our storytelling. And um, it just took us to the next plateau to where it opened up doors and opened up fans to be able to accept us and get us out of the realm of being the little brothers of NWA, so to speak. Um, and that just followed with Menace. Uh, Menace was more in depth. Um, it was more um, focused on the individual as far as not thinking you got a way out. I think that story hit it home with a lot of dudes in the neighborhoods and just a lot of people who were in the struggle. Um, so that song took me around the world like three times. I traveled Japan, you know, Europe. I went somewhere everywhere, you know, some places a young black Compton kid would have never been. Uh, so the successes of those soundtracks kind of put me in a realm of where it was worldwide attention and it got a lot of people focused on MC8 and the type of music I put out and um, the storytelling, like you said, you know, my music was always geared at telling people stories about living in the hood, growing up in the hood. It was never to glorify gang banging or colors or whatever. Basically it was just to show a lot of people the pitfalls of gang banging and living in poverty and growing up in that type of area. So my songs kind of hit home when it dealt with movies like that, you know, movies of there's no hope, no escape, gang life, you know, death, you know, police harassment and racial profiling and all that. So because I lived it, you get me? Um, it wasn't a story, you know? I, we used to get jacked by the police every day just for standing in the front yard, uh, you know, um, four deep in the car with black hats on, you're getting pulled over, two of y'all going to jail, one might get beat up, you know? It was what I went through every day as a teenager between the ages of 13 and 19, you get me? So it was easy for me to tell those stories especially seeing it on the screen and seeing people write about it. And then I go, well, shit, I went through that yesterday. You get, so it yeah. kind of helped, it kind of helped the situation. Yeah. When Straight Up Menace was out, yeah, like no exaggeration. I probably listened to that song three times a day for three straight months, you know, Good looking. and, and, and uh, you know, I couldn't find, it was before the days of like YouTube, just put in anything you want and it comes up. I couldn't find the remix that, that they played in the film. So I recorded that joint, the audio, you know, even though it's just a snippet. <laughs> exactly. So, like, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Cause it was hard to find for a yeah. minute. I couldn't yeah. find it for a while too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so obviously AWAX and Menace was an iconic character, you know, um, but is it true that that part was originally intended for MC Ren? Uh, yes. Um, I was just rapping, man. I wasn't thinking about acting or none of that. Um, I hung out on the uh, Boys in the Hood set. Like I said, I used to run with JD from the Lynch Mob. Shout out JD, free money to JD. Um, we used to just go up to the set every day, hang out, hang out, hang out. Uh, did I ever think that would be me? No, I wasn't trying to do no acting or none of that. Um, so with the success of those movies, uh, Boys in the Hood, uh, what else? We had uh, South Central, we had Colors, uh, you know, then there was Juice, you know. So with the success of those movies, thus we have the, the Hughes brothers, you know, two young cats from LA, went to film school, you know, got a script from this cat who was Minister Society. So the Hughes brothers come from Tupac. Um, they worked with Tupac in the beginning of his career, uh, shot all his videos in the beginning of his career. 
uh, Brenda's got a baby, uh, keep your head up, uh, holla if you hear me. They shot all them videos. So they had a connection with Pac already. Um, so they got the deal from New Line to do the movie. Uh, and I guess their first choice was Ren. Um, I guess they called Ren in a couple of times to read. Um, I guess it didn't work out after Ren. So I got the phone call. Um, how, how did it come to you? Like what made them think about you next? Watching my videos. Mm. Watching videos like one time gaffled them up. Watching videos like uh, growing up in the hood. I think I had the hood took me under, um, you know, watching those videos and basically living in LA and hearing my music. You know, we had the video jukebox, you know, K-Day. So I was on my, I think maybe second album going on my third. I was on my second album was out and I was in the midst of writing my third album, Music to Drive By. And I went on tour. I came back. Uh, we had just got ready to drop Music to Drive By. I was doing a promo. I was on promo tour. Um, I got a call from my manager and said that some dudes want you to come read for a movie part. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. Ain't nobody finna fuck with no MC8. You know, no way. But uh, I got back home. Uh, I went to Hollywood, read a piece of the script. I went back home. A week later, I went back on tour. I got another call. They said they wanted me to come back for another read. So I'm like, man, y'all fucking up my, you know, I'm, I got to go to the neighborhood and hang out. I ain't got time because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mess with Hollywood. Hollywood was off limits to niggas like me. You got no business in no Hollywood. So they call me again. I go to Hollywood again. I read again, a different part, um, a different piece of the script. I mean, and um, left. Hey, thanks. You know, thanks for coming in. I left. Uh, I think I was in Cleveland on the show. And my manager called me and said, you got to come back to L.A. because they finna give you the part. And they want you to start coming to the meetings and the readings. And so that's how Minister Society fell in my lap. I just happened to get a chance to go read the script for them. And they liked to read and they called me back. And then people was telling me, you usually don't get two callbacks. If you get two callbacks, they probably interested. So when they called me the second time, my attorney told me, you better prepare to maybe you know, so they called that third time. I went back in and that was it. Next time I went to the uh, meeting, it was me, Jada, Tyron, Lorenz. It was Pac. You know, it was all of us in the room. And that's how I, mean, that's how I came up off the part. You know, so, it's yeah, crazy. It was, a, it was originally rent, uh, meant for MC Ren, though. It's crazy because even though you were a first time actor, you had some of the most memorable lines in the film. You know, y'all here in the hood, you know, ain't nobody got no snaps on the Petro. And I, I kind of, um, you know, how did you prep? I ad libbed a lot of that. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, they gave me the ability to ad lib a lot of my script uh, because it's supposed to be portraying a certain look or a certain feel in this. And me being a motherfucker who coming from Compton every day to come to the movie set, I just got through hanging out on the block with 15 niggas like three hours ago. So when you bring me into this setting and you putting on me the clothes and all that, and I'm like, we don't wear this shit. We don't wear this. We don't talk like that. So they gave me ability to ad lib. So shit like snaps on the petrol and all that shit, that came just from hanging in the neighborhood every day because that's what we said. Money was snaps, gas was petrol. So that's what that was just everyday sayings. And so when I would ad lib and they would hear it, they would go, oh yeah, let's do that again. Keep that what you just said, eight. Or when we was in the car rolling, looking for the enemy, you know, I'm rolling up wheel we. That ain't no props. I'm smoking. Like they allowed me to do a lot of the shit that I did coming from Compton every day. 
and they knew it. They knew I was pulling up straight from the block every day. So they would go, hey, eight, you know, what about this? What about this outfit? What about these shoes? What about these pants? And I'd be like, nope to that. Yep, keep that. Nope, nope. We don't wear that. We don't talk like that. Scratch that shit. Bingo. So that's why my character had a little more natural feel to it because when I would see shit in the book, in the script, and I would go, mm, you could take that out right there because we do not talk like that. And they'd be like, okay, well, what is something you would say? I'd, be, I'd say something like this. And then they'd be go, okay, say that. So I had a lot of freedom on the movie. I didn't have to follow the script, you know. So besides that blunt, your lines in the car, that was you too? That was you at living? Going there, yes. fuck them yeah. days, get the fuck, yeah, oh wow. Okay. <laughs> Nigga, give me my motherfucking joint. Yeah. You know, all that shit was ad libs because you wanted the natural feel about that. You got three dudes in the car looking to go do a drive-by on somebody. You don't want it to seem like, man, this shit looks scripted or you know, you want shit to be natural. That's why it was a camera right in my fucking face. But you can't tell I'm looking past the camera trying to get a look like I'm looking for motherfuckers on the creek. But it's a big ass camera right in my face. You have to adjust to that. And that was shit I had to get used to coming from being a rapper in the street type of dude to going to six, seven million dollar budget movies and shit like that. You know, so it, it worked out pretty good because, like I said, I was able to ad lib a lot and put my own flavor to my character, so to speak, you know, because if you want to give that real feel and that real aspect of dudes out on the block and whatever, then you got to let me bring a little more natural ability to it. So I was allowed to do that on some shit, I, not I, everything, but on some shit. You know, I know that, you know, some time happened between, you know, Menace and then you did a bunch of movies with Mac and you did other things. Obviously GTA was huge. But I would love to see, you know, a point, maybe even beyond that character where, hey, I mean, your commitment was so strong to the cause that you that you return to acting. I mean, is that something that you still keep in your immediate radar? Um, I'm not a person who, quit, you know, go after it, but I feel if somebody saw that I would bring value to a character in that type of movie situation, because... My thing about back then, after I did Minish, I got a couple of uh, scripts to read. Everything was comedy shit, mm. you know. I'm not no comedian. I didn't want to be made fun of, you know, just in that aspect, you know. I represent a certain way of life in my music, and nothing is comical about it. So I didn't want to play uh, you know, the comic re black relief character in a film. I didn't want to do that shit. So when the, when, the, when the script started coming like that, I just told my people, like, stop taking, I'm not doing no motherfucking movies. I'm not. So I'm not an actor. I'm not looking for scripts and I'm not looking for jobs. I'm not finna go on auditions and all that. I'm just going to go back to rapping for Compton's mm -hmm. Most Wanted. And that's what I did. You know, the Mac situation came along. I was fucking with Mac. I mean, Thicker Than Water was a hood movie. Uh, it told the tale of the neighborhood. So, of course, you know, me and Mac was cool. So I got down on that. Uh, I did an independent film, uh, 100 Kilos, which was the story of Freeway Rick. Um, that was pretty cool. You know, like I said, dealing with you know, with what I came from and familiar to. And then I got the opportunities to do Grand Theft Auto, which was, you know, uh, huge because of the generation, like you said, the generation. So now it's a lot of young kids. They playing Grand Theft Auto. They're listening to the music. So I felt that that was a good opportunity to introduce myself to the young kids. You know, I had a son at the time who was seven or eight, you know, so to hear me in a video game and to see a character, it made him and his friends in shock and basically introduced me to the younger crowd coming up because a lot of people who didn't hear Compton's Most Wanted right. or maybe was too young or whatever, they focus on, oh, MC8, you the character in Grand Theft Auto and blah, blah, blah. So it still allows people to focus and, and get a visual of who MC8 is. So that's why I did Grand Theft Auto. You mentioned your, your son, and I know one of the things you're active in outside of music is, is youth football. 
and I believe your son is is a star athlete. You know, is that yeah. that's correct? Are there any lessons that music or hip hop has taught you that that you apply as words of wisdom to the game of football? Uh, yeah, I tell them all the time: be humble. Don't be that. Don't be that. You know, you can play good. Don't be that arrogant motherfucker. I hate that. And I told him that's been me all my career. I never was the dude who, I'm MCA. I got my fucking platinum record and you know, I'm, I never was like that. I always stayed humble. Like I used to tell him, if I could be the dude who just made records, could get paid and didn't have to go out and, and mingle and be, do the, the limelight and all that shit, that would be me. And I try to tell him, you in sports, it's the same thing. The same thing as me in entertainment. You have to be humble and you have to watch everything. Watch your surroundings, watch the people you hang with, watch, just watch everything. And I think the first step of, of, of being humble and being down to earth and not trying to put yourself on a plateau of I'm here and the rest of y'all are here, like some artists do, you know, um, that will get you a long way. And I think my longevity comes from being a humble, just down to earth, you know, it is what it is. I'm where I'm supposed to be, not being jealous of anybody else or in their career or their success, congratulate, don't hate. And I think that's what's got me longevity because I try to stay in my lane and I do what I do, you get? So that's what I try to apply to him in sports. And as far as football and practice, you know, always tell them practice makes perfect. You know me, you know, I will sit here and I will write my own, my write my music out and I will sit here and listen to it a hundred times before I walk in the studio and record. Because first of all, I don't want to be in studio all damn night and I don't want to spend money all day. So y'all learn how to cut that shit and do it fast. So practice at home. Then once you get in the studio booth, I'm in there for five minutes. You get me? <laughs> Here's your money. I'm gone. People looking at me like, you done? Yeah. Like, you booked the studio for two hours. You're done in 15 minutes. Yeah. Because I'm not trying to be here all night. I got other things to do. So I tell him that too. Practice makes perfect. And no matter how big you become, stay humble. People will respect you and appreciate you more if you just act like you a regular cat. Mm. So, you know, you're one of the guys who helped to found the West Coast Sound. And over the last several years, you forged a partnership with one of the dudes who helped to build the East Coast Sound and DJ Premier. So how did you and Primo connect? Um, Primo was one of the first dudes that I got cool with going on tour. Back in my days, we did promo tours. Record companies sent you everywhere. So... On those promo tour were a lot of other artists, upcoming artists. And one of them was Gangstar. And I don't give a fuck where I went, they were there. <laughs> if I had to go do promo tour in Chicago, Gangstar was there. If I was doing a concert in LA, Gangstar was there. If I was in New York doing promo, Gangstar was there. Texas, Atlanta, we bumped into each other all the time. And my very first major concert in Anaheim at the Celebrity Theater was with Dubs, no, Above the Law, Dub C and Low Profile, Count is Most Wanted, and Gangstar. That was my first very major concert. So bumping into each other on the road, them being at the concert, I always had love for Guru and Primo. Like I said, fan first. So I used to listen to Manifest and all the other shit when they was on Wild Pitch. I was a fan. You get me? Even before I met them, I used to buy their 12 inches and bump them. So to, to be able to connect with them and then build a friendship, like, hey, man, we see y'all again on the road. Hey, hey, wookie woom. That just... It carried on. Whenever I would go to New York, I would hit Primo up. Hey, man, I just touched down. He would come pick me up from the hotel. We would go back to his crib. 
uh, Nas is there, uh, Tretch is around, uh, Busta Rhymes is around, you know, and I'm meeting all these dudes in young stages of my career and their career. And that love that Primo had for me um, just always stayed 20 something years later, you know, I could call Primo up right now in the middle of the night. Hey, he answered the phone. You know, we chat about our kids. He had his first son. I got a son in high school. So, you know, to follow that trend, his son is playing sports now, just started off playing baseball. My son has been in sports for 12 years. So we kind of talk about, you know, what to expect from the, from the sports world and the parents and all that shit. So it's just nice to have a general friend outside of hip hop because this industry is crazy and it's kind of hard to build certain relationships with people. But Primo is one of them dudes who uh, I've known since my career has started and I'll know him way after my career is over. And when I'm just like, you know, a dude sitting on the porch with the grandkids and chilling, Primo will probably be one of the dudes that I'm just on the phone with. How you doing today? Him and him and him and him and, him and face is like two dudes that that I build a relationship over the decades that it's like outside of rap. You get me? Me and me and Scarface ain't done a song and whoever, but I just talked to Scarface the other day. You know, mm -hmm. we do that. Whenever I'm sick, he calls me. Whenever he's sick, I call him. And that's just what it is, you know. And it is valuable to build those type of relationships, even in this music business, you know, cause this business is crazy. And just to have friends that's general that know what you've been through as far as, cause you done been through it yourself uh, on the hip hop level and the ins and out of this music business. So it's good to build them relationships. So that's the establishment of how I've met Primo. And like I said, we've been buddies to this day. So y'all had a relationship with decades it sounds like what 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 made you decide that you know 2017 was the time to come together and do a project with which way is west um i was heavy into coaching i hadn't done a record in who knows when because like i said um i started coaching when my son was five he's 16 now i coach every year head coach um it was a joy. I like that shit. You get me? I didn't have a, I still went on tour. I still went overseas. So I was still able to stay in the business, but I didn't have an urge to get in the studio and make records because shit, five days a week, I was on the football field. Two hours a day, five days a week, including Saturdays for games for fucking what? July through December every year for the last 12 years. So it really didn't urge me to get in the studio. Um, Primo uh, was working with one of his artists, Black Poet. Um, they had just put out an independent project through Premier's label, um, Year Round Records. Um, Premier did a, wanted to do a California remix to uh, one of his singles. Uh, uh, things ain't changed, ain't a damn thing changed. Um, so me and Melee got on the remix. And from there, um, Primo's like, hey, what you been doing? You know, the song came out tight. You know, you sound like you hungry. What you been working on? And honestly, I haven't been working on shit. So I told him, yeah, I got some songs. You know, I got, but I hadn't had shit. I didn't have not a song. So that night, I got on my social media and I just started hitting up producers for beats. And I connected with this one cat, Brink, and Brink started sending me like 15, 20 beats a day. Every two days, he would send me 15, 20 beats, 15, 20 beats. And I had a studio in the house. So I just started recording, record, 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 record. I looked up, I had 50 songs recorded. So I sent them to Primo, all of them. And about two weeks later, he sent me a list of about, send me a list of about 30 songs he liked it out of those 50. And then I think I narrowed it down to about 20 something songs. And then from there, uh, he said, let's put them out. So I sent them to him. He re he mixed them, mastered them. And that's how Which Way Is West was born. 
and he decided to do the Jia campaign. He reached out to everybody. That I was mean, dope. from Dre, he reached out from everybody, from Dre to to Khaled to fucking LL, LL. yeah, <laughs> to, to fucking. I mean, you name it. If they were in the industry and they, you know, he got them to do the Jia campaign. So that was real. That was real. That showed real love. You get me because. A lot of motherfuckers didn't have to do it, you know. Yeah. And like he said, it wasn't really about me because even though I made the phone call, he said, as soon as I said we putting this together for eight, the first thing a lot of them said was yeah. So <laughs> it kind of flowed like that. And like I said, uh, shout out to all the artists who participated in that. Like I said, we had some big name artists who participated. Nas, Dre, uh, LL Cool J. I mean... We have some big names who participated in that. So shout out to everybody who got down with that. And like I said, sometimes it's just the love for hip hop, keeping yeah. hip hop going. You know, dudes who started back in our days, you know, I come from that long ago time, that era, that dope era, so to speak. Um, so to have dudes like LL and Dre and, and people of that hip hop nature, dudes that i looked up to coming up you get me because you know ll was a, a a big inspiration as far as just being a, a good hip-hop artist so it, it kind of showed that you know people appreciated what i have done over the years of hip-hop and i might not be as big as some other artists but it just shows that people still know you know who mc8 is and what i have contributed to hip-hop so that was good looking yeah you know, um, I started off my career in entertainment as a lawyer back in the day. And the guy who gave me my first job was Mark Levinson. Uh, so in mm. 1997, um, you know, I walk in the door and he gives me, you know, a file that says DJ Premier Producer Rakim. You know, and I ended up working on Primo's work for two and, and Gangstar for two years. Mm. So go way back with Premier Salt of the Earth. And like, I could see how you, you dudes were bond like that, you know? Yes, yeah. indeed. Yes, and the Scarface, the brother one. That was the other photo I was going to ask you about. Is you know that there's an iconic photo of you, Scarface, Spice One, and I think the Fifth Ward boys in the back of right. a blue convertible. I think it was for the Source. I know that one's yeah, staged, the... but that photo yes. is just like that's iconic, man. That's that's hip hop history right there. They basically we had a full weekend that weekend because that was the actual weekend where we ended up at uh, Jay Prince's house out at his ranch and we had the big you know round table discussion about gangster rap and people were you know people were depicting us as gangsters on the mic and we were trying to get them to uh, adjust that to reality rap is what we were trying to push you know this is our reality you know you don't have a bunch of dudes uh gang banging on record so to speak you know not to confuse us with banging on wax the bloods and the crypts Word. you know um we didn't we wanted to not be a we wanted to not to be affiliated with the title gangster rap because we felt that that was putting a bad rap on us you know so we really wanted to push for reality rap because it was our reality that we were speaking on records. You know, we wasn't really, you know, even though the name of the game is try to make some income for the feature family, maybe get off the block, off the neighborhood, but we were really trying to tell you our realities of where we came from and what we had to go through as young, you know, young black men living in uh, Fifth Ward or Compton or South Park or you know we had to grow up in that so while we got this platform of videos and music and radio stations some of us really wanted to tell you about what it was like in the ghetto like who we wanted to tell you that so we didn't want people to stray away from it by trying to scare them into going, oh, them just gangsters. They just gangsters rapping, you know. I was the first one to go. I'm not a, I'm not gangster rapping because you don't hear me talk about my neighborhood or you don't hear me talk about the set or what we did to the other set, so to speak. My tales were stories that took you on a path of he grew up, 
he was without, he joined the gang, he ended up this, he's either in jail for life or he's dead in the ground. That's the harsh reality of what goes on in Compton. Mm. So we wanted to basically reality rap, you know, stop putting that tag on us as gangster rappers because you're trying to scare the masses and now we got all the political shit and all that. So that was a weekend where a lot of us, me, Spice, Scarface, I think Benzino was there. It was a few other rappers there and we had this little powwow at Jay Prince's ranch to where, you know, we were discussing the aspects of why, because we were from these ghettos and these poverty areas where they label us gangster rappers, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, to your point, you know, you mentioned it earlier with One Time Gaffled Them Up. That's one of the earliest kind of protest records against police profiling and brutality. So to see that in in whatever that was, 1990, 89, and earlier this year, Mm -hmm. you made a a brilliant record with Exhibit and Problem called Profile. Mm. So full circle, that's reality. That's not glorifying. I mean, you're wrapping in reality. We just try to, I mean, because people, a lot of people don't understand the 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 ins and outs of our music craft. Uh, people just see a lot of a lot of young black hungry motherfuckers trying to wear chains and platinum watches and diamonds and shit. And a lot of us be really trying to inform motherfuckers with our music because we don't have that political platform. Let's face it, we're young, you know, they look at us as young black uneducated motherfuckers from the ghetto who slung dope and shot at each other, you know? So we try to use the platform to make certain songs like that. I made one time gaffle them up because we was getting fucking gaffled every other day for no reason. We couldn't understand it. Like, damn, all I did was hit the corner Turn the corner in my car, and now I got three cars behind me with police lights pulling me out the car, harassing me, tearing my car up, searching for the car, looking for product, looking for guns, and I was just coming from going to the neighborhood. wasn't on so we were trying to tell you the aspects of what we were going through and the reality of where we were living in our songs, and of course. You know, when you in those situations and you growing up in the hood, you know, shit is graphic. Yes, we see drive-by killings. Yes, it's some dudes who participate in drive-bys. Yeah, we see the whores on the corner and the crack and the dope and the racial profiling. So this is my platform. I'm a I'm a rap to you about it. So that's that's what that is. Hold on, let me get my let me get my plug right quick. Yeah, no doubt. That was the nature of, you know, we just tried to be in reality and tell you about what what was going on as far as where we was living at and growing up, you know, that that was just it in the nutshell. Wake a few punk asses up. <laughs> That's you it. Know, uh, you know, um, you guys along with NWA put Compton on the map with reality rap and there's a crew now on the east uh, that has put Buffalo on the map through reality rap, you know, the Griselda crew. So, you know, what do you think about the movement they built? Um, I've been paying attention to Griselda for a minute. Um, when West Side Gun first hit the scene, um, I used to listen to a lot of his stuff. It was different. I like to listen to different shit. Um, I like to listen to shit when other people can't understand it. I like to listen to it and, and break it down. Um, he was always one of those artists to me that was, you know, different in his class, distinctive voice, you know, the singy shit, you know, I, 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 that was some shit that was different to me. So I listened to West Side Gun a little bit and then uh, I started paying attention to Benny the Butcher about a couple of years ago, heard a little stuff. And then that in turn put me on the Conway mm-hmm. and I just fell in love with his shit because he he was real grimy to me. Um, hold up. So he was real grimy to me. So um, Premier had worked with them on a song, I think last year called Loyalty or something like that. And uh, from there, I just inquired, you know, I asked Primo, you know, uh, how was they shit? How was they in the studio? What was the blah, blah? And he was like, no, they good peoples. You know, repping repping Buffalo. You know, they've always been about their shit. So 
I hit Conway up because I wanted to get him on the lessons record. Um, I had a song in mind, a beat I had got that I thought was perfect. It had that New York feel. So I hit him up, sent it to him, and he hit me back immediately. Like, you know, mad respect, you know, always, uh, uh, you know, paid attention to what you was doing. You know, you represent for the, you know, the real niggas, the grimy. So that collaboration came about. And like I said, at first it starts off with being a fan. And that's something I am with artists. I, I, I have to be a fan of your music before I just want to run out and get you on a record. I'm not about shit like that. Like, oh, this dude's popular, so fuck it. Let me go get him. Nah, I don't give a fuck if you're popular or not. You got to fit that format of what we own. We got to be on the same page, so to speak. You know, and like that, I'm not going to probably uh, fit in with a dude who's doing pop rap shit. You get me? So I try to fuck with dudes who hit home on where my foundation of hip hop came from. So the collaborations I picked and when I got down with Conway, it was it just it just came out natural. I mean, it was my first single off of Lessons. I mean, it's still cranking up noise right now. Uh, people hit me every day about Hancho. So like I said, it's all about the respect and having respect for the other artists, even the young cats. You know, mm -hmm. you got to you got to have young for them to have respect for you. You got to have respect for them. So you got to respect what they doing and bring it to the table. You know, not all, but it's certain ones I feel that really admire this hip hop and wants to keep this foundational going. You go, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's what I was going to say, you know, from Conway to Kendrick to Problem to Davies, you work with younger artists consistently. So how do you keep your finger on the pulse? Uh, I just listen. I'm an admirer of, of hip hop, old, young and old, uh, new, new and past. Um, I still listen to old school shit, but then I listen to new stuff too from artists. I think that's how I keep in tune with it. Having a 16 year old son, he keeps me up on all the new shit. He keeps me up on all the latest artists that's good or whatever, you know, and I value his opinion because he's a young cat who spends his money on a person's record or stream or whatever. So I listen to what he's listening to and I kind of try to blend that into the dudes I grew up with and try to come up with that balance so that when I do get down with a young cat, I'm, I'm familiar to his style and I'm familiar to what they're preaching about today. So like I say, once again, uh, just to keep this 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 great thing of hip hop going, you know, from when back in the past, from dudes like Melly Mel and the Treacherous Three and and the Roxanne Shantae era to now, where we got the you know the the the, the NBA young boys and the little babies and and all those cats, you know, you just try to have to find some balance with hip hop because this is something that they didn't think would happen that would continue and look how far it's come. And look how far it's going. Hip hop is in everything right now. Mm -hmm. So just just you have to be open minded. And that's what I am when it comes to hip hop. You just gotta stay gap, you just gotta stay grounded and try to bridge the gap from the old to the young. And I think that's what'll help us. Yeah. You know, believe it or not, Kendrick's uh, good kid, Mad yeah. City, dropped eight years ago today, exactly. You know, so um I know that's a special one for, for Jake and, and for myself, but you know, what did that appearance do for you? Um, Kendrick introduced me to the new crowd, you know, um, between that uh, era, shout out to Kendrick, TDE, my boy Punch. Um, I appreciated the, the invite to be on Kendrick's uh, record. Um, as you know, you know, uh, TDE and Aftermath is very particular who they fuck with as far as their artists are concerned. So to get that tap on the shoulder uh, to get down with Kendrick uh, just showed me that some dudes look at my shit like I look at theirs. Respect, you know, uh, respect to the foundation of Compton rap, so to speak. Uh, Kendrick is our next uh, 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 torch holder for Compton. You know, like we in the Olympics. I got it from uh, Easy. Easy and them got it from Toddy T and Spade and them. You know, so it's just the passing of the torch. You know, game is in there. Quick is in there. You know, a lot of us are passing the torch. And Kendrick, uh, problem. You know, they're the young crowd. They're the young dudes. So um, 
just to have them look over to a dude like eight and go, yeah, we want to get eight on the record. To me, that just showed uh, my work and my contribution to hip hop and Compton rap as some dudes that they felt um, gave them sort of a foundation of what they do as far as representing and taking it to the next level of Compton. Because like I said, we got a lot of artists over here in Compton and they probably could have chose anyone, but you know, with the, with the, with the, uh, with the grace, they decided to come to me because I feel like maybe they felt like eight has been a dude that's been consistent his whole career. He's never strayed away from his uh, aspect of what he did. It's always been Compton. It's never been anything different. It's never been uh, the, the trend of trying to do what everybody else is doing just to get ahead or get on top or make a dollar or whatever. Eight has always stuck to eight. So doing that song with Kendrick is basically describing, you know, a good kid in a mad city growing up in Compton and seeing what happened and having people involved in that life. And then you can turn around and hear it from an older cat who lived that life and he can actually spit it on record next to me. That's what I took from that record. And it just, like I said, it just opened the younger generation to MC8 who didn't see Menace or Boys in the Hood, who don't know about music to drive by or we come strapped, you know, who are just being introduced as far as Grand Theft Auto is concerned. That is what that record did for me. And as far as introducing me to another side of hip hop, as far as the youth crowd is concerned. So it was a big deal. And you know, the water, no Compton. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm, I, no, I was just saying, what's in the water in Compton? Because you have <laughs> so many great <laughs> shows, You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, that's right. Yeah. And for, for five years, that was, you go on Spotify, that was Kendrick's biggest song. There's never a video or anything like that. People resonated with the record. That's, that's what I love about it. And um, so two more questions for you, Aiden, then we're going to let you get back to your night. The record this year that I really resonate is your collaboration with Talib Kweli. And I have to ask, I mean, you know, you've been so generous with Reggie and I tonight. You had a great interview with, you know, Talib's People's Party earlier this year. Did you guys record that song the same day as the podcast? I did. Okay. I met Talib that day. Uh, we chopped it up. And before I walked out, I said, I need to get you on the record. Yeah. And the minute he said, send me the beat, I ran immediately home and recorded. <laughs> and I sent it. I put my verse down and then I sent it to him. Um, one of those guys, like, I just felt like he's a dude, like, you put in extensive work as far as, uh, um, as far as that that type of hip hop goes. Yeah. You know, the 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 public enemy, the conscious rap. You know, uh, I've always admired uh, Tali. I was a big fan of the uh, him and High Tech record. Oh yeah, uh, love that record. God damn, I love that record. Reflects the eternal. Yeah. samples, man. Man, that goddamn yeah. record is hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Woo! But I was a fan, man. Um, just, you know, you run across certain dudes. And me, when I run across dudes, I like to let them know, man, I used to bang your shit every day. Mm. You know, I want to give them that. Like you said, you give them their flowers, you know, so... I, 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 when they asked me to do the show, I wanted to go on there because I just wanted to basically meet Tali. You know what I'm saying? Listening to his music all these years, I've never ran across him, never bumped into him at a show. So I'm a genuine, I'm a genuine fan of real hip hop. You That's get so me? Cool. I know how to pay that respect. So I couldn't let him get out of my way, man. I couldn't. Like, man, you, man, I, I got I to gotta get you on a song. I don't know what the hell it's going to be about because I'm coming from my side right. and you're coming from that side. But opposites attract, man. So I think it was a beautiful collaboration because it just came out perfect. Because after I heard his verse, he made me go back and rewrite my verse oh, okay. and I changed it up and got on his page. So I tried to basically feed off of what he was talking about and just tried to flow it in. And 
it, it, it just it was a perfect mix. I mean, the beat, I mean, the beat when I got it, I wanted it to be something different. I didn't want it to be your typical ass, you know, regular. And I wanted it to be something when people saw it, they would go, wow, what is that one about? When they yeah. see that I did the collaboration before even listening to the song, you're already curious and thinking about what the hell would these two sound like on a song together so that's why basically i pushed it because i think that it was something that people would just really just drop their jaw and be like what eight on a song with talib man i gotta see what that's about so i think it came out pretty dope well that's what i was gonna say like most people like who know you and your sound wouldn't necessarily think that you would be like you would love the talib Kweli album so you know, not top or anything like that, but like who are like your five like favorite MCs? You know, like who who do you who's your rotation? Um honestly, Rock Him, um, EPMD. Um, as far as uh I still listen to Kendrick. Kendrick's one of my favorite. Ice Cube's one of my all-time favorites. And then um Scarface, them is my top five right now. Yeah, I me... listen to some of that. I listen to at least one song from them dudes every day. <laughs> Word. I think all and I've been doing it for that. ever since I've been listening to hip hop. You will hear me bang EPMD like it's crazy because that's who we patterned ourselves after CMW, EPMD. I mean, that was our man. I know everybody was NWA and you know, whatever, but for me and Chill, it was EPMD, man. We was, man, EPMD made me want to form Compton's Most Wanted. Rakim made me want to rap. Mm -hmm. If you wasn't a fucking fan of Eric B as president, then something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't love that motherfucking single when it first dropped, something is wrong with your ears. I used to record that song on K-Day when the motherfucking used to pick up Spanish channels in the background. <laughs> and I used to try to record it on my boom box. And all you could hear was people speaking in Spanish with a lot of static. Shh, but you could hear that I came in the door, said it. And that's what sold me and made me want to stop gang banging and start rapping right there. Change your life. And well, that changed my life. I had no direction of nothing. I was gang banging, selling drugs, just no direction. And when I heard Eric B as president on a K-Day Mix Master show with Uncle Jam's Army, it made me pick up a pen and a notepad, straight up. That's hell. So that's, that's an appropriate place to end, A. Um, looking at your career, which you continue to add to, I'm so glad that you and Premier cross paths and reignited that fire for you to release music but when you look at the span of the last 30 years not the biggest not your favorite but just as an mc as mc8 what is the verse you're most proud of the verse i'm most proud of from my whole career I would probably have to say uh, my verse from the Music to Drive By album, the Miss uh, the Drive By Miss Daisy song, um, because in that song, it was the reality of one of the homies going through that situation. So when I wrote that song, I was really speaking from the aspect of one of my homies who had his people house ran up in and everybody gets shot and smoked. So. A lot of my verses I try to hit in reality, but when I listen to Drive By uh, Miss Daisy and I hear those screams and that screams of the lady in the background and the way Slip constructed that song, I think it's probably one of my prolific songs that deals with reality and deals with the uh, pitfalls of being in the neighborhood and being in a gang and that lifestyle because you never know. It's always the innocent who fall behind the shit. So that song kind of hit home to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, MC8, man. Uh, like I said, I'm a huge fan and uh, this has definitely been a highlight. Uh, you know, thank you for joining us. 
and the man, thank is- y'all man for having me man yeah, I, man. I appreciate the love man you know what i'm saying we don't we don't get it we don't get to extend it too much nowadays but i appreciate you people pe- appreciate y'all for giving me the time the platform to come on and speak with y'all the fans good looking man no doubt the album is lessons out now on every streaming platform yo salute thank you Jill. Yeah.